of the day, and I had been watching all the presentations we had so far, this is going to be a little different talk. What I want to do is show some problems that we solved around energy systems that have a large practical value, but we haven't really found good ways to analyze um, and obtain theoretical results and maybe improve the algorithms that we have. So this can serve maybe as a motivation for looking again at these problems and coming up with new ways to address them. So s many other speakers talked about challenges that you're seeing in the energy system. So here's the traditional energy system, which is a hierarchical system where generation follows load. And it's currently optimized and scheduled in a centralized way. What's happening today is that we are seeing um, the appearance of a lot of different resources. First of all, in the generation side, we're starting to see the adoption of renewables and potentially storage in the future, as well as in the distribution side, consumers are starting to adopt things like electric vehicles, solar panels, and smart appliances. One big question that is around this system is how can we coordinate all of the resources consumers have so that we can start shaping the demand to follow the supply. In order to do that, there is some important challenges. The first one is that in the system as it is, trans the transmission network is very well known and well modeled. And it's extremely reliable to send power from one place to the other. That's not the case around the distribution network. Second, we need to understand how to start coordinating a large number of these resources using things like the cloud and so on and so forth. So typically, we are coordinating around 10,000 to 20,000 things here. Here, we are one or two orders of magnitude larger. Okay. So how is the traditional coordination would be done if I was trying to, say, do this for consumers today? It's a very simple idea. Let's just assume first that I only have solar panels and a battery at each consumer. And then I'm also observing their load, which I can't really shape or control. The idea is super simple. You just solve an optimization problem where you minimize the total daily cost over all the customers subject to various constraints. The physics of the power flow, which has to do with constraints around this network here, the constraints of the storage operation, so both you know that you can only discharge so much, charge so much, and limits, and so on. And the fact that since I'm solving this um, right now, but I do have to take into account future decisions, I need to somehow model the stochasticity of the load. And finally, ideally, you want to take somehow into account the information architecture. If I assume that I can constantly signal everything, I can potentially imagine this optimization running in the cloud and every second just transmitting information to all my storage units. Um, the information architecture is quite simple. And maybe you can just use MPC or you can use some other variants of dynamic programming to sort this out. So that's kind of the traditional problem setting. So in fact, the problem is that here we assume various things. First of all, we assume that we knew this physical network. We assume that these loads are kind of easy to forecast. And we assume that this architecture is simple. But in practice, what we are seeing is that, first of all, if you go and talk to utility operators, the network model is not known. In fact, it can be quite complicated. For example, if I am pg and &E, I may not know the network model, but potentially I could learn it. But if I am Tesla, I may not know the network model, and I may not have access to all the sensors to learn about it. And I have to start thinking about how am I going to do this optimization, taking into account the various constraints I'm subject to. The second thing is the information architecture is not simple. And here are some of the issues. First of all, it's really unrealistic to expect the cloud to be able to signal all the storage devices in real time, all the time. And once you start taking that into account, you have to consider two issues. One is the fact that maybe you're operating under multiple time scales. 
So one for the storages and the homes which are making decisions in real time, maybe another one to plan in the cloud to coordinate things together. And the second issue is that you may face information delays. So for example, today, all the smart meters that we have, the data that's collected from them faces like a certain amount of delay. And the last issue here is that forecasting loads and renewables is hard. So one of the things that we have been doing at Stanford is we have had different projects where we addressed these questions Particularly today, I will talk about the first two. Uh, one is, you know, how to learn these network models. So we came up with a series of uh, statistically proper, practical algorithms for which we don't really have a very good performance analysis. But they perform very well in practice, including with um, data from the utility and so on. And I'll show you a little bit about that. And the second one is we have another project which is looking at this coordination. And what we found is some algorithms that seem to work well in simulations. And these are really complex simulations. And also we started implementing on a lab that we have where we have all these resources for real. Um, but again, we need to gain better understanding of the theoretical underpinning of that. I'm not going to talk about forecasting today. But there's also a lot to be thought about when you start to scale forecasting to hundreds of thousands of these time series of loads and solar and so on and how to do it. OK, so let's just start with this network model learning. So here's kind of the simple problem formulation. Each node here is a node in my power network. And these are the branches that connect these nodes together. And I have observations which are the voltage measurement, I can assume that I measure the magnitude of the voltage and the phase angle. So these are kind of, I'm actually looking at the time signal, it's going to be a sine wave of the voltage. I'm going to take every cycle and look at the magnitude, or maybe every few, you know, tens of cycles, it's going to give me a magnitude. And the phase angle is the phase angle difference between the sine waves in different locations in the system. OK, so that's your typical measurement. Maybe you also have a similar measurement for current and then the real and reactive power that you're consuming in each location. Traditionally, what's happening at the utility level is that this whole network is not fully known. So for example, maybe these branches that are dotted here are not known. And the question is, you want to try to learn them. OK, so find what is the topology in this box. So how do you go about doing that? Here's kind of a very simple approach. You can go and map this you know, physical problem into a statistical problem. And I can say on every node I have a measurement. And then edges between these nodes will cause my joint distribution of the variables to have certain property. And I can use that property to kind of learn what's going on. So what is that property? So here's the idea that we, we, we did. You, know, you can, for example, quantize all these measurements. And you can say there is a joint distribution. And normally, you will be able to decompose the joint distribution of measurements in that way for every time instant. But if you actually look at the power network structure, which is a radial network, which means it's a tree, um, you can actually assert that there is a conditional independence between the voltages. And these, you have to remember, are the phasers. So the voltage magnitude and phase angle, so that you can decompose this joint distribution in this way. In order to make this assertion, um, it's not super hard. But basically, what you have to assume is that the correlation between the consumptions of different users is not super high. And even when this is kind of violated in practice, these algorithms that we try out work very well using this assumption. So the question is, finding that topology is the same as finding this, who is the parent of every node okay, in this setting. And here is what I mentioned before. You know, In order to make that assertion, all you need to do is you can write the equations for voltage and current phasor relationships in this network, and then demonstrate that as you condition on this guy, the voltages here are going to be independent. And the basic assumption to do that 
is that these currents are independent, which in practice translates to the power consumed that every node is independent. Are you assuming okay. a radial network? In this first example, yes. Okay. So you do that, and basically now you can, there is a host of algorithms you can use. The most popular one being take the mutual information between the measurements in the different nodes and minimize that and tell me which is the um, joint distribution that kind of minimizes um, this quantity so that, sorry, that maxi minimizes the divergence which basically maximizes the mutual information. And that you can show it's a maximum weighted spanning tree problem and you get a simple algorithm. This is a well-known algorithm called the cho -Liu algorithm. And there's a very nice review paper on this written by Martin Wainwright here from Berkeley. So the point is, this is a neat algorithm. And then we went about trying it out in a series of networks. There's a bunch of standard network examples. So here are some of them. You know, This is the 123 bus um, example. And I'm just showing you some empirical results here. You can see I erased a certain number of nodes from my network, and I'm checking whether I am able to recover them correctly. Okay, And there is a certain amount of noise that's added to this, which is equivalent to the noise in the real world sensors. And you can see the Chao Liu algorithm works well when I have both V and theta, which is consistent with my original assumption of conditional independence. But even it works well only when I have the V measurement. You can see it also has a very low error rate. And in contrast, there is various practical approaches. And one of the ones that we compared it to is the traditional one, which is to solve a regression problem and identify who the nodes are. And that's kind of very poor. And the other one is to linearize the power flow equations and and go about your business that way. And that also does very poorly. As soon as you have more than five or 10 unknown edges in your system. In fact, we tried this method in our paper that we published about this. We have a 3,000 bus examples at 2,998 nodes. And we took real data from PG&E. We took the solar data from NREL. And we basically asked this network to be reconstructed thousands of times. So it just can do a stochastic example. And in the thousands of times we ran, it has zero errors, which means we had to run 10,000 times. But in the paper, we just noted that, OK, this algorithm is super robust. Yes? What do you do with the solid data? You subtracted them to the loads? Be yeah, so we are considering the injection for each node to be the sum of the loads minus the solar. Then okay. They are not independent, right? That's really true. Yet the algorithm worked very well. That's exactly one of the questions we had. Why is that happening? So it's quite challenging to analyze this algorithm, but it is an open question. And that was one of the first ones. Hey, um, yeah. How do you calculate these probabilities exactly? The probabilities here in. Um, Ah, so you have, you, you can just numerically calculate. So once I quantize the voltages in different levels, I just calculate the joint distributions of the, of, of the counts of the data. So I map them into, I have, so I'm going to show that to you next. Can you say the voltage is the magnitude and the angle? You can try both. But the these conditional probabilities, it's. The quantization is going to be for both. Um, but they are going to be different for each. So you have to take into account that mean and the standard deviation. We just took a standard quantizer from the signal processing book and applied it here. And it worked well. But I'll also show you a second algorithm that does not do any quantization. Um, it's a little bit more complex. But here's one interesting observation. We had data of different types. We had data from smart meters, which is either 30 minutes average power or 60 minutes average power. We also had a data set that allowed us to test this when you have very high resolution measurements. And kind of what you notice is that you do need a large time history, 
maybe about 1,000 measurements of this one minute, about 100 of 30, and then as you aggregate more, it doesn't really help much. So here's one question, you know, how do we determine the length? But there's another more important question. In practice, today, these networks are kind of static. So I could use this algorithm, and this is what we did for Southern California Edison in a project with Slack. We used this algorithm and corrected the network models for various feeders that they are using for their planning. But if you think about what's going to happen in the future, these networks are going to switch far more often. There's more active controls and ideas like that. And one of the questions is, how do you do online learning and updating with this type of algorithm? It's not very obvious. One of the things that we were thinking about, maybe you can use some kind of change point detection. But if I have thousands of nodes and I have to detect the change in each one of them, this may be complicated. Yes? Here it was a single phase, but we have an equivalent uh, paper for the three phase, but not just us. Now, after these papers are published about a year ago, there's a whole literature now around these methods. But in the whole literature, again, we do not have any analysis of why it works as it works, but you will see very similar plots. Okay. So a third question is, here we had to assume the system is radial. Well, how do you learn with loops? One simple thing that you can do is kind of look at the mutual information formulation when you have loops. And just to get quickly by this, um, the idea is super simple. You can fix one edge, assume it, and then run your tree algorithm. That will ensure, if I know I have at most one loop, that will find you know, one loop. And then you can do that for two loops and so on, and you will get some kind of complexity, exponential complexity. And again, this is kind of well known from this literature. This is how these methods are applied. Uh, yes? There is a line of work which does the same thing, but it sort of does a pruning at each node. I see. I see. I'll show you another alternative, yet another way of doing this, which is slightly different which is maybe you can consider, OK, I will look at the problem again and have a slightly different description. So here I have, again, my joint distribution of the measurements. And I can observe a same type of uh, conditional independence relationship if I consider neighbors instead of parents. So if I have a general network, I just consider neighbors. If I have a radial network, I just consider parents, OK? And uh, then, as you can expect, this is kind of now old news. Uh, in the old days, you would run something like Lasso, which is what we wanted to do. And here's what we did. You can just take each one of these complex variables and say, OK, I'm going to run a regression where the variable at node i is regressed against the variables in the other nodes. OK? And basically, if there is a conditional, if there is a dependency relationship between these two nodes, this coefficient is going to be not zero. OK? And since the distribution grid is kind of sparse, you can run something like the lasso. And one of the things here is that you need to be careful is all the variables are complex, so you have to make adjustments to this algorithm. Um, so, but you can also, for example, make changes to this. You can slightly write this formulation slightly differently and then get something like what's called a group lasso and, and so on and so forth. So you can apply various algorithms from the literature. And basically, by finding who the non-zero elements of beta are, you can find the neighborhood set, the structure of the network. The one question, though, that will arise is the following observation, right? I will have two coefficients when I regress vj to vi and vi to vj. How to make a decision on which, whether this link exists or not. So we wrote this as a maximum likelihood problem and did the proper thing, and it becomes a combinatorial problem. And then, in fact, we just had a simple heuristic, like what's shown here. The simple heuristic says if both the betas are non-zero, let's assume it's going to be the edge exists, or in case either one is zero, we may also consider the edge exists. Um, 
But then we do kind of a combination of all of these rules by noting the following observation. In a distribution network, the magnitude of the voltage tells me something about how far things might be from me. And then you can do some heuristic based on that to combine these two decisions. Um, and I can explain the details of the heuristic after the talk here. Uh, and then we ran this algorithm. And again, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, it does extremely well. So here's another example where we added loops to a existing radial network example. And the method works well. Kind of the existing alternative that was out there in the literature at that time is some kind of correlation-based example. And again, if you look at how the error rate behaves with the amount of data, you may need about a year of data for this thing to work correctly, assuming that I'm sampling the data every, 20, every hour. Okay, So that's the number of samples for this to work properly, which is far larger than that mutual information-based algorithm. But why is this the case? I don't really know. So that's another question that's left in there. But it seems to work for all the examples. And I think when we submitted this particular paper, uh, reviewers had a list of like 20 different networks you're supposed to run to get it published. So we ran it on all of those. Again, it seems to work but we don't know why. Now, the question of online learning in this setting is also um, interesting. I think there's two challenges here. One is itself how to do it, given that you need a lot of data. But suppose I'm here. I already learned something correctly. From that point onwards, can I learn changes in the network? And how to do that correctly um, is not necessarily known today. Okay, so this is one example of a power problem that can take us to think about these methods um, and advance them more fundamentally. So now I want to go into a different problem. And this is actually about scheduling the DERs. And this is actually joint work with, with Thomas and Kyle, who are two PhD students, and Abbas, who's sitting there in the audience. So, what I want to look into is what happens when you have different information architectures and uh, uh, how do you do this optimization. But in order to motivate that, um, here's kind of a short uh, um, motivation. So I'm going to take this example of a distribution network. It's a 47 bus network. And for each node here, I'm going to aggregate about between 20 to um, uh, 30 homes. And I just want to run what happens when I add solar and storage to this. So since I have five minutes. So here is one observation. If every home is subject to time of use prices, which are high in the middle of the day and low elsewhere, you can expect that if I have a battery, I will charge here and discharge there. Okay, That's kind of the cost minimizing uh, action. And then arbitrage profit is the money you make over this operation of buying and selling and so on. So it's whatever you receive as a payment minus the cost. Okay. In terms of the constraints in the network, I definitely want to keep the voltage deviations at a minimum. So traditionally, in your optimal power flow, you're going to consider voltage in all the locations in the network as a constraint. What we did is, if you, in fact, look at practical systems, there is a lot of voltage violations. So you can actually penalize them. And if you choose this penalty carefully, um, it characterizes kind of the existing performance in the system today. So what we are going to say is we have this electric power quality metric, which captures the voltage constraints. And here is kind of what it looks like. Okay. And if we looked at what happens in the system as the solar penetration increases, you're going to see that these voltage violations are going to reduce as I get more solar because loads are getting reduced at some point. And then when the solar penetration goes higher than that, then these voltage violations start to increase. And this is kind of what we see in practice today, where they say, OK, in Hawaii, there's too much solar. We are seeing voltage issues. Now, if I added storage into this picture, I can actually look into that and also notice that here's different penetration levels of storage. And you can see that as you add more storage, maybe the violations go higher 
in the beginning at the low penetration of solar. Because everybody is discharging at the same time, therefore it's very, unlike, very likely that maybe you're violating the lower bound of the voltages when you're discharging the batteries everywhere in this network, okay? And in fact, what you will notice is we did some simulation studies, so Thomas ran this for us, and he found out that when you have different types of policies, if I allow you to net meter, which is what is there today, you have a higher number of violations, but obviously you can get more cost. But if I don't allow you to net meter, meaning I can't average all the power that I sent into the network over all time and get compensated for that, then I'm going to actually have less, the cost is gonna be lower here, but then I have less violations. But the one thing that we could potentially do is do coordination. And through coordination, maybe achieve a balance between these two things. So now the coordination challenge, here's the interesting observation. First of all, there's actually three players in this system, or at least two players. The network operator, the guy who manages this distribution network, like PG&E in California. And then you have the DR providers. These are the guys like Tesla who have access to the private cloud. They can read the information in your batteries and maybe send signals and co-optimize them. If I want to create a system to satisfy this, maybe I want to incorporate this issue as a constraint as well. So the fact that, that we have these two types of operators and maybe we want them to cooperate somehow. But the second issue that we need to take into account is the simple observation that whenever I'm trying to read data from these guys or send signals, there is some time delay. This time delay can capture many things, such as the delay from reading the sensor information and uploading it, as well as the fact that the cloud system itself cannot really run in real time. That sounds really surprising, but if you think about it, if I have 100,000 homes and I'm sending signals to all of them and trying to run in a cloud from Google, um, it has to have a certain reliability that it doesn't require today when you are looking at a Netflix video and buffering and so on and so forth. And this was an observation actually from Google itself when they were trying to build a system like this for storage, okay? So what we have as a challenge is one, we have this delay. Potentially we would like our solution to look like this. Homes or the DR provider does some optimization himself without having to know everything about the network. And the coordinator who knows everything about the network somehow doesn't need to tell what all of these guys have to do but provide some enough information that uh, can help them, but then it's running at a much slower time scale, okay? And that's kind of the algorithm that we came up with, um, and this is actually, Kyle figured this out, trying it out, actually. This is the surprising part, and the algorithm is kind of simple. In the cloud, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take, run a model predictive control, so you're going to just predict what all these homes are gonna do in the aggregate, and then you're going to just find a nominal solution for your optimization, taking into account all the network constraints. And that's what we call here the global optimum. You can maybe also generate various scenarios so that you can sample all the possible trajectories for these homes, and now if I know that the homes are gonna vary in different scenarios, I can also calculate things like a bound. So I can try to figure out if the net injection on every node is between certain limits, is it going to, it's going to be a safe operating state for the network. I don't really care what you do, but as long as you keep between these bounds. So this is kind of the bounds optimization. The surprising part here is that you, to do this, it's quite complicated if I have to take into account all of the homes simultaneously. So what we do is we fix everybody add this nominal operating point and then try to find the bound for each home, okay? This is our empirical strategy. And then the local controller, all that, it, all that it receives, two pieces of information. One, kind of a nominal trajectory that would be good for a home to follow if it is trying to minimize cost. And second, these actual bounds. But then it actually can take decisions much, much faster and in real time. So it runs its own optimization. So this is the control strategy. I'm gonna skip all of this. 
And basically what we find is that this strategy works very well. So here is kind of one metric of this. I'm having different delays in the cloud, and this is the arbitrage profit. And you can see here, these are all, the values are very close to each other. Uh, but even if I'm delayed by 24 hours, so I'm running this cloud once a day, okay, still the system does extremely well. And this is not just for this numerical example. We have tried it for a few other networks and so on. And similarly, you can see that compared to no coordination, no matter what the delay is, this coordinated mechanism has a far lower rate of voltage violations. Similarly, here is kind of a different levels of storage. So we tried simulation-wise adding different amounts of storage into the system. And again, you can see a huge gain from the coordination. And finally, kind of a surprising result for us, which is what made us spend a lot of time to kind of improve this method and um, decide to try it out in the real world in practice, was this particular result. So here I have different levels of storage penetration. And this is the actual total arbitrage profit ob obtained by all the homes. This maximum assumes that everything is known. So we call it perfect foresight. So there's no stochasticity, and the network is known centrally, and you run the centralized optimization. And in black is the coordinated version. Okay. So that's kind of very, very close. And in fact, it's about 80%. We are able to accrue, on average, about 80% of the optimum with this simple scheme. And we actually also have been testing out what happens if we want the homes not just to minimize cost, but to follow different patterns like ramps and different types of signals. So right now, what, what we, we found a bunch of empirical consequences of these type of things. These, an algorithm like this allows you to find out, do you need a lot of storage or little storage, where to place storage, and things like that. But also, it can be used in the real world. So we have an RPE project that is helping test this in a real world setting and implement, implementing it and testing it. But one question that we have been looking into, but it is quite interesting and it seems quite hard, is how do you analyze the performance of this architecture? And if you have these type of constraints, what is the optimal decision procedure? So it's kind of in between decentralized control and uh, um, distributed control. So it's kind of a mixed architecture. Um, but maybe through some simplifications or something like that, this could be lead to some insight. In fact, there were some recent papers by Nikolai Matny, who was here a few moments ago. Uh, that looked at a similar architecture, but not the same. But if you try the design they had and the particular signals they were sending, it did not do so well here. So again, there's a lot to be understood for things that work well versus things that are theoretically sound. I think that's one of the messages here. So that's the conclusion here. I'm happy to talk to you guys about this. And I think in power systems today, if you look at everything that's happening in practice, there's a series of algorithms that have been tuned empirically with very little explanation. And there is a bunch of theoretical stuff that doesn't always work in the real world. So that's kind of where we are right now. OK. Thank you. So. Thank you. And I'm sure you'll have to answer a few questions. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in the state estimation literature, what they have, what they assume is that there may be some switches whose position is unknown, and then you may go about finding it greedily. If you apply, if you apply that for, for example, for the radial system you will obtain this. But there's another big difference between these two, as far as I can say. Typically, in state estimation, they're considering a one-shot.
problem. You're not allowed to use the information over time. So if I only have a one shot, I can't really run any of these methods. But if you considered the information over time, put it through the traditional state estimator, and you say, okay, I want to minimize least squares, and I want to find these discrete variables, these methods are approximations to that. And this is kind of a known result in stats. Yeah. You can use more than one shot. That's right. That's right. So th this is why we focus on this distribution system case in, in, in this example, because it gives you a little bit more constraints. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we should thank them again. Yeah. Okay.